Hello, good day, and welcome to Readings in Philippine History. So for this lesson, pag-uusapan pa rin natin ang part 2 ng introductory part ng subject na to, which is the kinds and repositories of primary resources and the colonial and Philippine historiography. So first, kinds and repositories of primary resources. Establishing the reliability of primary sources is vital in studying history. It is equally important for one to identify the various kinds of primary sources as used in different avenues. So this lesson presents the classification of primary sources and the obtainability of each. Bakit nga ba natin paulit-ulit pinag-uusapan ng primary secondary resources na to? So well, simple lang po. Para malaman naman natin kung reliable ba kung saan ang galing ito, and dapat bang paniwalaan. For example, in present time, magbabanggit na lang ako ng mga malaking companies like a media na mayroong problema when it comes to dissemination of information. For example, is the Rappler. Okay? Hindi ko sinasabing lahat is fake news, pero nagkakamali din sila. And ABS-CBN, maliban dun sa hindi sila nakapagbayad na kailangan dapat nilang bayaran, meron din problema dun when it comes to news report. So, hindi lang yung mga yun. Maraming pang iba. SMNI, CNN, and wala akong pinapasarig ang kandidato dito. Pero, yun ang nagiging, nagiging problema kapag hindi natin inaalam kung totoo nga ba yung kwento or hindi. Primary sources may be published or unpublished documents. Published documents are those that are intended for public distribution or use, such as newspapers, magazines, books, reports, government documents, laws, court decisions, literary works, posters, maps, and advertisements. The fact that these documents are published does not mean that they are reliable, accurate, or truthful. The readers must comprehend not just the substance of the document but also the background of the author, as it may be written based on the author's perspective. Kasi nga kung titignan natin, hindi perket public ito and alam ng nakarami is totoo na. So next is the unpublished documents. Unlike published ones, may be difficult to locate as they are kept in private and hence may not be easily accessed by the public. These documents are also confidential and are restricted from public use like personal letters which are in the possession of the recipients. Documents such as diaries, journals, letters, wheels, and other personal papers that are not published may be used as primary sources. Yes, isang malaking halimbawa po sa kasaysayan ng Pilipinas ay yung sulat na nanggaling daw kay Emilio Aguinaldo na pinapunta si Hinara Luna sa Kabanatuan. Alam naman natin na haka-haka noon na ang nagpapatay daw kay Hinara Luna is no other than the president that time, si Emilio Aguinaldo. But according to Emilio Aguinaldo, bago siya mamatay, nilinis yung pangalan niya na hindi siya ang pumatay kay Antonio Luna and hindi nga siya nagutos na pumunta siya doon sa Kabanatuan. Pero later on, isa sa mga kamag-anak ni Antonio Luna, may nilabas na letter at nagpapatunay na yun daw yung sulat kamay ng unang presidente. So, isang malaking pagbabago sa kasaysayan kung totoo man ito. And it will serve as an evidence. Primary sources may also be unwritten. This may include oral traditions, oral histories, artworks, and artifacts. Traditions and histories or stories transferred through generations may tell us something about the past. Accepted as primary sources of this kind are those that come from people who have actually witnessed or experienced the past events. So ito yung paglilinaw sa pag-aaral ng history. Hindi lang po mga written documents sa pinag-aaralan dito. Pwede rin yung mga oral traditions. Ano nga ba ang halimbawa ng oral traditions? Ito yung mga kwento na naipasa from generation to generation. And ngayon, pinaniniwalaan pa rin natin. So for example na lang din, um, hindi na natin alam kung ano yung ibig sabihin, pero naniniwala pa rin ang karamihang Filipino. Like, bawal magwalis sa gabi dahil maitataboy mo ang swerte. So saan nga ba nagugat yung kasabihan na yan? Kahit, at, kahit tanongin nyo sa parents nyo, nalaman lang din nila sa parents nila yan. At Kung sino man pinakamatanda na boy sa Pilipinas ngayon, for sure nalaman niya lang din yan doon sa mga kwento ng matatanda. 
So, naipasa-pasa na. Well, may nabasa akong isang article regarding dito and nagugulat kayo kung paano nagkaroon ng twist ang story na yan. Way back, pre-Spanish times, bago pa dumating mga Espanyol, ang mga maharlika noon ay naumuhay sa mga kagubatan and wala pang form ng electricity noon. Which means, alas 4 pa lang, alas 5 pa lang, kumakain at natutulog na sila. Bakit? Madilim na. So, kung magwawalis ka sa gabi, hindi mo nakikita kung anong winawalis mo. Baka naiwawalis mo na yung mga mahalagang bagay. At doon nagugat ang kasabihang ito na huwag kang magwalis sa gabi, baka lumabas yung swerte. And yung kwentong to, kung trace natin, wala siyang definite or exact time kung kailan talaga nag-start yung paniniwalang to. Panahon pa ni Kopong Kopong. Okay, ito rin ulit, panahon ni Kopong Kopong. Sino si Kopong Kopong? Lagi ko naririnig yan when it comes to a storytelling na sabi natin matagal na pumapasok si Kopong Kopong. Meron pa panahon ni Hitler, panahon ni Mahoma. So, nag-research ako sa mga taong yan, nag-exist talaga sila, Mahoma. Pero si Kopong Kopong, until now, wala pa rin akong idea kung sino si Kopong Kopong. So, if you're still here, pwede bang comment down below, any educated guess, pwede. Sagutin nyo kung sino si Kopong Kopong. And now, let's move on to artworks and artifacts. Still, these under from unwritten sources. So, other unwritten sources may include artworks and artifacts. These are visual documents that tell us several views of the past from the perspective of creators, such as drawings, paintings, sculptures, photographs, and artifacts are some of the visual documents that may have captured historic moments and provide evidence to changes that happened over time. Okay, so ito naman, this is the rare wood sculpture of by Jose Rizal. Okay, now let's move on to colonial historiography. Philippine historiography has changed significantly since the 20th century. For a long time, Spanish colonizers presented our history in two parts. A period of darkness or backwardness before they arrived and a consequent period of advancement or enlightenment when they came. So yun lang naman ang pinapakita ng mga Espanyol. Kung hindi dahil sa amin, hindi gaganda ang buhay nyo. Kung hindi kami pumunta sa bansang ito, namumuhay pa rin kayo ng paurong. So yun yung sinasabi ng mga colonial historiographers. Spanish chroniclers wrote a lot about the Philippines, but their historical accounts emphasized the primacy of colonization to liberate Filipinos from their backward barbaric life ways. So yung mga books na napublish noon ay mostly perspective nila. At wala man lang mga Filipino writers noon. In the same manner, American colonial writers also shared the same worldview of the predecessors by rationalizing their colonization of Filipinos as a way to teach the natives the civilized lifestyle. Okay, so medyo pinaganda lang din yung sinabi ng mga Amerikano, pero still, andun pa rin yung uh, barbaric life ways. Sila daw ang dahilan kaya naging sibilisado ang mga Filipinos naman ngayon. which they said the Spaniards forgot to impart including personal hygiene and public administration. Colonial narratives have portrayed Filipinos as a people bereft of an advanced culture and a respectable history. This perception challenged Filipino intellectuals beginning in the 1800s to rectify such cultural bias or prejudice. So sa mga panahon ding ito, meron na rin tayong mga historians na sariling atin. at kayang baguhin kung ano ang pagkakamali sa nakaraan. In 1890, Jose Rizal came out with an annotation of Antonio de Morgas sa Sisos de las Islas Filipinas, a book originally published in 1609. He used de Morgas' book, a rare Spanish publication that positively viewed pre-colonial Filipino culture as a retort to the arrogant Spaniards. So, bakit ganon? Karamihan ng mga Spaniards negative ang pagtiin sa Filipino, pero si Morga, positive. Subjective yung pananaw sa mga Filipinos at walang bias. Nakitira siya sa mga Filipinos noon and he is also a lawyer. And now let's move on to Philippine historiography after World War II. In the 1950s, Teodoro Agoncillo pioneered nationalist historiography in the country by highlighting the role of Filipino reformists and revolutionaries. From 1872, the year that saw the execution of the Gomborsa priest, to the end of the Philippine Revolution as a focal point of a country's national building narrative. 
Two of his most celebrated books focus on the impact of the Philippine Revolution, the revolt of the masses of the story of Bonifacio and the Katipunan, and Malolos, the Crisis of Republic. His writings veered away from emphasizing colonial period and regarded events before 1872 as part of the country's lost history. The discourse of lost history by Teodoro Agoncillo was not accepted by another known scholar named Renato Constantino, whose published work entitled The Miseducation of the Filipino, it became a staple reading for academics and activists beginning in the late 1960s. Constantino advanced the idea of a people's history, a study of the past that sought to analyze society by searching out people's voices from colonial historical materials that typically endeared Filipinos as decadent, inept, and vile. Following this mode of historical inquiry, he authored The Philippines, A Past Revisited, a college textbook that offered a more critical reading of Philippine history compared to Agoncillo's history of the Filipino people. Undoubtedly, these two nationalist scholars inspired or challenged other historians to reevaluate the country's national history. Other Filipino historians set new directions in redefining Philippine historiography in the last 30 years of the 20th century. The first of these scholars is Zeus Salazar, who conceptualized Pantayong Pananaw as an approach to understanding the past from our own cultural frame and language. He emphasized the value of our Austronesian roots in defining Filipino culture and encouraged other scholars to conduct outstanding historical researches in the Filipino, such as the work of Jaime Veneracion's Kasaysayan ng Bulacan. Equally important is the contribution of Rinaldo Ilieto, who wrote about his history from below. Treaties in his groundbreaking work, Passion and Revolution, Popular Movements in the Philippines, in this work, Ilieto endeavored to recognize the way of thinking of ordinary folks by using alternative historical sources such as folk songs and prayers. His other works spurred new interpretations such as common topics such as Jose Rizal, Philippine-American War, and American colonization. There is also Samuel Tan, another prolific historian who is best remembered for mainstreaming the role and relevance of Filipino Muslims in the country's national history. His definitive work, The Filipino Muslim Armed Struggle, soothed to examine the struggle of Filipino Muslims in the context of 20th century nation-building dynamics during the American colonial regime and subsequent post-colonial Filipino administrations. In his book, A History of the Philippines, Tan attempted to write a national history reflective of the historical experiences not only of lowland Christianized Filipinos, but also of the other cultural communities in the archipelago.